The condition is really crazy condition. And that shouldn't give away the whole secret to professional winter. Matei Yakino giving up to our power off his body. Here we go. What a finish. The guy is kind of talking bullshit. The team has just got to work a little harder. Welcome to the Windsurfing Podcast, back again for episode three, and this week we have got a guy who has been around the block, yeah, he's, he's actually been to the Olympics in 1992, uh, he's been there in the glory days of the PBA, he's still currently racing on the PWA, uh, he's got involved with sail design, we're going to hear him talk about some of the big guns, Antoine Albo, Bjorn Dunkerbeck, um, and we're also going to hear him talk about the future of the PWA and how he sees it going. And it is, of course, the one, the only, El Presidente, Jimmy Diaz. So Jimmy Diaz, born in Madrid, Spain, Dutch yeah. urban mother, Colombian dad, um, lived and grew up in St. Croix, Virgin Islands, lived in Maui, Gran Canaria and now Turkey. Dude, how many passports do you own and how many are you actually <laughs> eligible for if you want to have them? <laughs> yeah, that's that's an interesting question. Actually it's it's quite funny because my dad my dad's Colombian, my mother's from Aruba. You know, I guess you could say my family's from the Caribbean basin, actually, you know, and, and my dad was a chemical engineer and he went to Spain to do a project and he ended up staying there for think about 10 years and had uh, had three kids there, you know, so I was born in Spain, but I don't have any Spanish blood in me. And um, actually, the funny part is my dad came over to the US from Colombia, and he got naturalized. And then we were born, then we we were automatically American citizens. So I've, I've only ever held the US passport. Uh, how was how was growing up? Obviously, you grew up in in Saint Croix in, um, in the Virgin Islands, U.S. Virgin Islands. Yeah. Uh, how how was that? It's an incredible place to grow up in. Um, the people in the Virgin Islands are are you know incredibly incredibly nice, friendly people. Um, I, I couldn't have asked for a better better upbringing. Upbringing, really. You know, it's uh, we en- we ended up going to. Uh, I, I went to a very good school over there. My education was very good. Uh, that's where I learned to windsurf. Uh, the conditions were unbelievable for that. The whole setting uh, was there. And, you know, the place is, is, like the song says, the place is nice. Virgin Island's nice. <laughs> yeah, I read, I read in an interview, you said there was quite a big scene uh, of, of windsurfing, which is a little bit surprising, um, you know, having grown up a couple years later than you, you know, imagining a place with maybe 50,000 people uh, living and, and having actually a proper scene. Yeah, I, I'm, not sure if, I'm not sure if a big scene is, is uh, the correct term, you know, I think, uh, especially when you're younger, you kind of see things uh, being bigger than what they were. But we had a healthy scene there in St. Croix, and we probably had fleets, I think in the racing uh, fleets, maybe about 30, 40 people uh, just on St. Croix, if that. Um, and then in St. Thomas, St. John, and in Tortola and, and Virgin Gorda, in the British Virgin Islands, it was more. So whenever we would have both uh, just local races on St. Croix, and then, and then we would have, uh, you know, so-called national races. The Virgin Islands is a territory of the U.S., you know, so it's not, uh, it's not a state. It's, it has a different political designation. But we would have races uh, in St. Thomas or St. John or Tortola all the time, and the groups would come together, and they, 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 they'd get pretty big in numbers, you know, and that's, that's actually where I met Finian for the first time. You know, we did a race. Uh, I think the first time he was maybe – God, 10 years old and I was uh I think I'm six years older than him you know so I was 16 and and well, uh, was he bigger he, than you already he was already you know he was the same size as he is now so at 10 so <laughs> <laughs> you would you would have never guessed he was 10 or 11 years old but no he was a big kid you know he's a big uh he was a big jolly kid and and um but anyway the scene there was in, was was incredibly nice and it was 
it was um, it played a huge role in my formative years, let's say, in terms of competition, and and that's where I I got my first taste of windsurfing competition, and everything grew out of there. So, you know, I I I I, I have very very good memories of that whole situation there. Yeah, I think Finian once said he he hasn't been under a hundred since he was thirteen. So. I mean, he really, he really was a big kid, you know, and fast. Straight line speed was unbelievably fast as, as you know, as he is today. So yeah. not, not much change there from his side. So how, how the hell does a kid from a small island in the Caribbean become a pro windsurfer? In the era of no internet, no connections, no, you know... Just, yeah, just decide to do it and go. <laughs> I mean, interesting. I, it, it's not something I decided um, uh, I'm going to become a professional windsurfer. The, the whole thought process wasn't like that. I got into the sport. They started organizing some races. I participated in them, uh, got last the first race I ever did, got last the second race I ever did, third, fourth, fifth race. You know, I was just last, last, last. And then slowly started improving, you know, and, and getting better. And, and, um, you know, the better I became, the more fun I had, I guess, you know, I, I think that's, that's the interesting thing about our competition, you know, the any better, sport, I guess. any sport, you know, the better you do, the more fun it is, you know, and the worse you do, the more miserable it is. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I think it got to a point where we had a very, very nice race uh, in the Virgin Islands, start off in St. Thomas. It's called Hook In and Hold On. And this was the race that allowed me, this was my first uh, international competition, if you could call it that. Because at that time, it was incredibly popular, and we had maybe 250 to 300 sailors uh, participating in that. And it was a point-to-point -point, uh, race over a period of a week. And we would start in St. Thomas and then sail over. We were all living on boats, sail over to St. John, then from St. John to Tortola, then different parts of Tortola, then Virgin Gorda. And then we would cruise around the whole Virgin Islands, which is unbelievably beautiful. And this became... Hey, just, just like my, my setting right now, correct? Exactly. Just like where you're sitting, yeah? <laughs> and so... This race, this race was getting bigger and bigger every year, and and um, uh, the first year I decided to to do it, I think I think it was the first year I did it. it. Might have been the second year, but I wrote I wrote a little letter as a let me think, probably fourteen or fifteen year old kid. I wrote a letter to F two, I think it was F two America at the time, and I said, "Hi, my name is this," and. I would like to, you know, I'm going to go participate in, in this race and I would like to get sponsored, something like that. You know, not quite sure what, what kind of response. I had no idea how to go about getting sponsors. And to my surprise, they wrote back and they said, look, you win, your, you win the junior division. We'll let you keep the equipment. We're going to send you some, you know, board and two sales, three sales. And you win your division, you keep it. If you don't win, you know, give it back or we'll, we'll sell it to you at a discount. And, uh, but if you do win, keep it and we'll see from there, you know, see if anything Amazing. more is there. So I won my division and actually I think I finished, uh, I don't know, top five, maybe overall, something like this, you know, and, and I got lucky because the president of F2 America was there. The president of F2, uh, was there at the time and they kind of saw, and they just kind of pulled me aside and they said, you know what, uh, we, we'd actually like to sponsor you and, and, um, uh, let's see what you can do, you know? And I think two or three weeks later, they sent me to California to, to do a qualifying series for the world championships, which were in Lake Garda that year. And I went to the U S and I qualified, you know, you had to be top three in the series and I qualified for that. Then they flew me out to Italy to Lake Garda. And that's where I saw this little blonde kid for the first time. And you know, I saw him, I think I remember the first time I saw him, he's there in the corner sanding some fin or his board or something like that. And everybody was kind of whispering, kind of saying, you know, that's, that's Bjorn, this kid from the Canaries Island. He's, you know, from the Canary Islands, he's really good, you know, and I'm, and I was, I think I was actually bigger than him at the time, you know, we're, we're, we're about the same age. I'm several months older than him, but uh, yeah, that was the first time I heard of Bjorn and, and this talent, uh, 
you know, so that, that was basically my start is, is they, they started sponsoring me from that point on and, and I was still in high school and they actually started sending me a check also, you know, I was like, wow, this is incredible getting, getting a little bit of money for, for doing this windsurfing thing. And then it started, you know, it got me thinking if there's an actual career that can be made out of this, because I, I never really thought of it as, as a possibility at that point. You know, well, you must have been pretty, pretty good, obviously. They, don't, they didn't, even in the golden years, they didn't just go out and pay anyone. So, you know, I think, I think the sport was booming at that time, you know, and I think companies were looking to, to grab talent quickly and, and uh, you know, and, and I think uh, th there was money going around at that time. You know, I wasn't getting, you know, I think I was getting paid something like $500 a month or something like this. I can't, I can't remember the exact amount, you know, it wasn't. It wasn't huge money or anything like that, but I think the companies uh, were selling a lot of equipment at the time and, and they wanted to, to uh, you know, they had the budget to sponsor people and, and the sport was growing and, you know, it was a good, it was a good time to be, to be in it. Well, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot or anything, but what kind of years are we talking about? Late 80s? Is that? Yeah, yeah. This was, this was uh, let's see, I graduated from high school in 86, you know, so it was uh, around this period, uh, 85, 86. And then actually when I graduated high school, I still wasn't convinced you could make a living out of this thing, you know, and I certainly had opportunities to go and compete and keep that. But my intention was graduating from high school and going to university, you know, and then these opportunities presented themselves to for me to go and compete and travel. And in my head, it wasn't still clear that, you know, you could be a professional windsurfer, even though I'm reading all the magazines and I see Robbie Nash and Ken Winner and Anders and all these guys, you know, and, but I, it didn't, you know, I was like, okay, I'm this kid from the Virgin Islands and, you know, can I, can I do that also? It wasn't, it wasn't really so, so much in my, in my, um, in my thinking. And I, I actually registered, enrolled in university at that time and was going to go straight to university. And then uh, I, I just kind of said, you know what, I want to give this windsurfing thing a try. And I said, I told my parents, I'm going to take a year off and do this. And, you know, my mom freaked out a little bit. My dad, my dad, my dad was quite a mellow person in that respect. He goes, this is what you want to do. This makes you happy. Then go for it. That year turned into two years, you know, and, and I, and I struggled in competition. It wasn't like I went in there and I was top 10 or top 15 or top 20 for that matter. So it was a difficult thing and I wasn't still sure about it, you know, and then I said, you know what, maybe I need to go to university and, 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 you know, get a degree and, this professional windsurfing is probably not uh, in the cards. I was thinking, you know, I, actually I was quite conflicted, not from any pressure from my parents or anything, but conflicted about if there's a legitimate career to be had there. So in the end, I decided by myself, let's, let's go to university, you know, and I was able to, so that's when, that's when I went to University of Colorado. It was a landlocked, landlocked place, which probably... Yeah knowing what I ended up doing wasn't the smartest decision, but I was thinking differently at the time. You know, I grew up uh, surrounded by water and I'd never been to the mountains and skiing and things like that. And I wanted to be an engineer. I actually got my degree in electrical engineering, but at the time I didn't, you know, I wasn't thinking windsurfing as a career anymore. I mean, there's skiing in California. You could have gone to... I, if if I could do it again, I'd probably do it a little bit differently. You know, I probably would have gone to Maui and gone to the community college there first, <laughs> and you know, seeing seeing how I ended up, uh, how things panned out. You know, but it was it was it it wasn't. You know, now I see people like you, for example, and I've known you for quite a long time. Uh, you know, I think the first time I saw you uh, was in Poland, probably in Weba, something like that. You yeah, know, like and two thousand and. I think, yeah. And so I think now you guys are, you know, a lot of a lot of windsurfers, professional windsurfers from quite an early age decided, you know what, this is what I'm going to do. And this is I'm going to commit myself to it and, and go for it. And, and um, my, my, my story wasn't like that. It kind of evolved into it. And it wasn't until I was in university, I think, the going into the second year that I realized, you know what, I I want to be a professional windsurfer. I see, now I understand, you know, you can make a living out of this and there's a career to be had. 
and this is what I want to do. And I, I actually got into this real big conflict in my head and somewhat of a depression because I kept reading windsurfing magazines and seeing all these guys in there that I had competed against, beaten, and I see how well they're doing and everything. And I was just like, I, I need to do this. I can't be, you know, sitting in an office in 40, 50 years old going, I should have done it, you know? Yeah. And then I just said to myself, all right. Really, really interesting that you're saying this because I, not knowing that you went through this, I went through exactly the same because me, I'm probably not the best example of what you said, probably like Pierre or maybe Gabriel Brown, you know, really committing at an early age. I actually fully graduated high school normally, went to university and in university, I realized like, shit, you know, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be stuck in class. And I seen all these guys, just like you say, just like you say, I was competing with, with Pierre, with Gabriel, with Enes, with all these, this was kind of the crop, Alex Cousin, uh, Sebastian Cordell, all, but all these guys committed and I didn't. And when I went on tour, I was so far behind, just after a year and a half of not doing it or, or doing it much less than they, you know, at that stage, at that point. So it's absolutely amazing that you actually managed to A, graduate from university and B, come back because me after five years, I would be so far behind that there is like no chance, you know? So. It, it's, yeah, this is, this is, this was difficult and, but I did compete in the summers. So I was going to the school then in the summers I would compete, I would do several events you know, but it was, it was completely half-assed. I even went to the Olympics in this period, you know. I was going to ask you about that later, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so then that was quite funny because I took an Olympic board to Colorado and got there, you know, and I never had a car when I was in university, so I managed to get it to this, to this lake, you know, and store it in some place over there. And I remember one day deciding to go, to go train, you know, and I take my bike out there and, it's cold. It's really cold. You know, it's Colorado and in Boulder, which is, you know, a mile high. And I'm looking at the lake from a distance on my bike, you know, and I'm like, oh, it looks like white caps. It doesn't look like any wind. You know, I'm like really confused about it. And finally I get to the lake and it's like, there's still white caps there. And, you know, then I feel the, feel the lake and it's just ice. And I'm like, oh, maybe, maybe I don't have a clear understanding of this whole situation. You know, it's, you might need to come back in a couple of months once the ice melts, you know, but that was, it was, it was that, that. Was transfer straight away. Like what, <laughs> like yeah. windsurfing. Yeah. yeah. But, but also I grew up Caribbean, you know, I never saw, I never, uh, you know, I wasn't aware of those kind of things. So it was, it was a, a whole, the whole thing was quite comical, you know, but yeah, it was, it was difficult to, to, when I, when I committed to graduating, you know, and, and I even went through the whole interview process and in terms of trying to get jobs just to get experience, just in case something doesn't work out in windsurfing. And, and, uh, my final year, I wrote to some companies again, you know, I said, Hey, I'm coming back to racing, you know, and everybody's like, yeah, well, hmm, you know, yeah. it's been a while. Yeah. And a couple companies wrote back, you know, and said, we'll, we'll lend you some equipment, you know, we'll, we'll pay it in six months, something like that. And, I bought a car for a little truck for something like a thousand dollars, thousand two hundred dollars, best thousand two hundred dollars I've ever spent in my life, and drove out to the gorge. I knew there was, uh, you know, I, I basically graduated and said, okay, now let's go be a professional windsurfer, you know, and how do I start? And 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 I just said I looked at what what I could do, you know, and at that time the gorge had the best racing series in the U.S. I said, okay, let's you go. Probably there need and to windsurf to become a professional windsurfer again yeah. yeah you know so it was it was quite comical how, how my thinking was but I said okay let's go to the gorge and let's do some series there and prove yourself and get some sponsorship and then you can get on the tour little did I know at that stage it would take me something like three or four years to be able to even do my first event you know because to, to be able to get the sponsorship and the and the funding to to do that so I ended up going there and I remember the very first race we did, I was uh, maybe 
30 something, you know, and I remember going. And that's a Sunday back, series. Yeah. The like, Gorge, the Gorge series. Yeah. yeah. And I remember going back to my, to my little apartment. I rented a room in this house, you know, and, and that night and just taking a really hard look in the mirror and just saying, okay, you just spent, you know, four years busting your ass off at the school, getting a degree in electrical engineering. You put that completely aside, committed to this racing thing. You show up at a race and get probably close to last, you know? And I just, I, I, I almost like freaked out right there, but I, I just remember looking at the mirror and going, wow, this is, is this a huge mistake you're making right now, you know? And then, you know, just went back to the beach that they were having races every weekend, went back to the beach that week and trained some more. And the next race got 17th and the next race got seventh, the next race got fourth, you know? And then I was like, whew, you know, every time I could look in the mirror a little bit more comfortably and then things started clicking, you know, and, uh, and it just kind of grew from there, but it was a very difficult time also because I, I didn't know if I could make it. I wasn't making any money. I was, I was, uh, doing whatever, you know, I was teaching windsurfing, Rhonda Smith and, and Scott Sanchez, you know, Rhonda had a school in the gorge and, and I went to her and like, you know, I, can I do something at your school and teaching or whatever it is, you know, and I didn't know how to teach also, but, you know, she's like, yeah, yeah, do this. And, and I hooked up with Ken Winter at the time also, who was incredibly instrumental uh, to me at that time, you know, he kind of took me under his wings and, and uh, we would do projects together. He had all, you know, Ken Winters, a really, really uh, smart, innovative guy. And he was doing a lot of things at that time. And Probably one and, of the best guys in the U.S. at the time. And like, maybe just put it in perspective a little bit, because for my generation, we don't even know who that is. So probably from what I read, like, like a top 10 guy in the world and in the early days and really, yeah, one of the stars, right? Early stars. Yeah. Not top 10, like top two, top three, you know, it was like, uh, you know, I think uh, several years it was Robbie in first and, you know, in racing and slalom, whatever, in him in second and or third, you know, he was, he was one of the very top guys there. And, and I remember first reading uh, about him in magazines, you know, but when I met him, I actually met him for the first time in the Bahamas in 1986, I think it was. And we had this race, uh, this long distance race. And there was a lot of big names there at the time, you know, and, and from not only from the U.S., but from Europe, you know, a lot of the top, top sailors were there in the world. And we did this race. We did this long distance race. And him and I, uh, you know, sailed away from the whole pack. And it was a light, light wind race. So I was... I was small at the time, or you know, small. I was one of the lightest guys there, and we just had this huge upwind battle to the finish line. And I just got him at the finish line, you know. And I was like, "Holy shit, I've won this race!" And I remember coming back to the beach, and Ken comes running over and just high fives me, and he was so stoked about it, you know. And I was like, "I was, I wasn't expecting that reaction from somebody losing to this unknown kid." You know, but he was he was really supportive, whereas other pros at that time just came to me and it's like, ah, you just got lucky, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, what assholes, you know? And but I remember that made a big impression on, on the or, guy. Or looking at the gear, what's going on there that, that you actually managed, right? Because you know, just just imagine, you know, somebody shows up at a PWA event right now and freaking wins a round, you know, and it's like nobody's heard of them and wins that's the whole freaking round. That, like that. No. Yeah, it's quite difficult, you know, and it was a little bit like that. Nobody knew who I was, you know, and suddenly I won a race, you know, it wasn't the event. Actually, I finished the event something like fifth or sixth overall or seventh, sixth, sixth or seventh, I think it was, you know, and this is a hundred thousand dollar event at the time, you know, so um, pretty, pretty decent, respectable result, I think, you know, but really nobody literally knew who I was. So, um, you know, it was really cool to get that impression from him and then years later when I went to the gorge and and uh, we would train a lot together and he just kind of took me under under his wing and I learned you know this is actually where I learned uh, testing you know he he got a job uh, in windsurfing magazine doing the equipment he was the equipment editor and then we'd get all the equipment from the manufacturers and test them all out and he's like Jimmy come you know come to Aruba come to North Carolina 
you know, come to these places, help me test out. And we would do that job. And that's how I learned. Those were my first uh, formative testing experiences, you know, and I'd learned tremendously. It's funny though, like a guy like this, um, imagine like somebody, some magazine today offers, uh, I don't know, Pierre or Ross Williams a, a, a testing job or Mateo or whoever. It's kind of like it doesn't really fit, right? Back then, I guess it was very, very different. Yeah, I think now it's, it's I think the, there's less importance on that, on that now, you know. But at the time, it, there was so much equipment out there, you know, and, and really getting these consumer reports is what it was about the equipment was quite important. You know, I think uh, uh, the German surf magazine still does a lot of them. You know, but it's, uh, I think it's become less and less relevant. And I think there's other forms of information out there now to, to understand what the equipment's all about and all that. But at, at those days, you know, you, you picked up, you wanted, you were interested in buying some windsurfing equipment. It is, you read one of those magazines and you read the evaluations about it and all that. We kind of sprinted, sprinted into like mid nineties, I guess. But during university, you won the, the Olympic ticket or bid for the Virgin Islands and you went to yeah. the Olympics. This, this was, you know, I don't know about you, you play a lot of sports also much. So I think when you're a kid, you play a lot of sports. The Olympics is one of the things you kind of look up to, you know, and, and for me, it was a big dream to go to the Olympics since, since I remember playing any sports, you know, and I was always looking at the Olympic athletes and all that. So it, it was a little bit surprising to go to the Olympics for windsurfing, but somehow in my head, I knew I was always going to, I knew I was going to go to the Olympics since I was a little kid. I just had no idea it would be through windsurfing. And, and that experience itself was unbelievable, you know. For me, maybe not so much, as you, like you say, because, yeah, you watch all these sports, but I, was, I grew up a windsurfer always. And, you know, my first board was a 78-liter wave board. For a kid, it was obviously huge or whatever. But, and in the Olympics, uh, it was Mistral One design that looked already super outdated, you know, uh, late yeah. 90s or early 2000s. So I was looking at the magazines, seeing Josh Stone spoken and seeing, you know, this young kid called Ricardo Campello doing all these crazy moves and, you know, these guys. And then I looked at the Olympics and I was like, no, you know, like, that. so, so how already at your time, it seems like, the gear at the Olympics was always a little bit outdated. Did it have that, that feel already? Like you're actually, yeah, you're doing a great thing. You're representing your country in the biggest event in the world, etc. but you have to do it on sort of shitty gear. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, and, and unfortunately, except for the 84 Olympics, we've never been on current equipment, you know, the Olympic equipment, that's been used was always not as good as the equipment that was available on that year, which is, you know, if it's the fourth year of the Olympics, you know, the fourth year of that cycle, then the design is four years old, you know? And so it's always had that element of it, but when you're inside it, you don't even think about the equipment anymore. You're just thinking about, you know, it's the Olympics. Let's so win it. <laughs> I, yeah, you're in it, you know, and, and uh, you know, I remember walking into the stadium at the opening ceremonies and, uh, you know, that's just unbelievable, that feeling, yeah. you know, even to this day, it gives me goosebumps. And the funny part about us, we, we walked to a certain stage, I think is in front of the queen and king, you know, uh, in the stadium. So you go around the whole stadium, then you get to the king and queen. And just as we get there, uh, there's an eruption, you know, in the stadium, just these massive cheers. And suddenly, you know, like, yeah, we're in Virgin Islands, so it's Woo! alphabetical. It's alphabetical, but the host country goes last, yeah? And just at that point, as we're approaching the king and queen, the Spanish team enters the stadium. So the, the whole stadium erupted for them. But at least to me, I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, for a second there, we believed it was for the Virgin Islands, which was quite funny. And here's this tiny little team from the Caribbean, you know, and the whole stadium erupts. But just the energy behind that, you know, and, and, and just realizing, wow, this is the Olympics. And, you know, it's, it's, quite, it's quite an interesting, special feeling, you know. So it definitely lived up to the hype of you as a kid sitting in front of the TV watching. Exactly, exactly. 
you know, and, and just, the, just the whole experience, not only the competition on the water. I didn't do so good there. You know, I, I, I finished, I don't know, 20 something, 26 or, or something like that. I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly bad with uh, remind, remembering uh, results and things like that. But um, Especially the just bad the whole, ones, right? I can't, I, I can remember the good ones, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Bad ones. Uh, but, you know, yeah, definitely, definitely a good experience. So something, something uh, I'm very glad that, that, that I was able to do. Okay, so you go through the whole graduating thing, the gorge, Ken Winner, and then you manage to get back on tour. How was the tour back then? How was the PBA, the Professional Board Sailing Association tour? Because it was the golden years, but how did it look from the inside? Well, well I think I missed, I missed the... the let's say the real golden years you know there was i think i was in university or struggling to get into the events you know trying to find my way there i think those were the 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 top peak years let's say so i just kind of missed that aspect of it but um you know there was there was a lot of events on tour uh the money was better the sponsorship uh was better at the time um and the industry was was a lot better, you know. So um, windsurfing was one of the original extreme sports, so to speak, you know. So it was uh, everybody, more companies wanted to to get involved with it, and it was easier to to have events, to organize events, to get uh, companies in, into the sport. It was also at a time where cigarette companies and alcohol companies were free to invest in sports you know and i think this is before a lot of regulation especially in the eu or in europe they at the did, time, right you know? they did invest massively into windsurfing they they you know peter stuyvesant wasn't a travel company you know and and uh, some alcohol brands were also in there and and you know they contributed a lot so you get back on tour and that little kid you saw in garda in in 88 or 89 or whatever it was is not really a kid <laughs> anymore is he I mean, he was, he was, a, he was an animal. He was unbeatable, unbeatable. I mean, it wasn't even, it wasn't even close. You know, if I could, if I could get close to him somehow on the course somewhere, whether it was slalom or course racing, uh, you know, he was, he was just past you so quickly. You know? Or ways or freestyle or whatever. I mean, he was, he was doing, yeah, he was doing everything, you know, and, and I actually, uh, the first time I went to Hawaii, going back, uh, when I got sponsored by F2, they took me out to Hawaii um, to go train, just to go train with the F2 team, with the international team, and, and him and I actually shared a room in those times, and, you know, how, how disciplined and how motivated he was, was unbelievable, much, you know, much, much more than anybody else I ever saw, you know, and it, and I would wake up in the morning, you know, and I'd hear some sounds outside in the yard and, and there he'd be by a tree, you know, doing pull-ups and, you know, working out, you know, and I'm just getting out of bed and I'm looking at him going, oh, wow, this guy's working out and he'd eat his breakfast and he'd just be chomping at the bit to get to the beach and he couldn't drive at the time. So he has to wait for everybody, you know, he has to wait for the rest of the team to, to get going and eat the breakfast, but he was just chomping at the bit to go and, and he was first one in the water and last one out and day after day after day, you know, and you, how, you how saw was, from that. How was he as a person? How was Bjorn as a person? Because he doesn't, I know, I know him a little bit and he's not the most outspoken and in any videos, he, he, he seems more like he kept to himself and he just went about his business and, and that's it and took care of the business really well. And that that's, all that mattered for him my my take my take on him is a lot of people maybe uh, over the years have not understood him so well in terms of you know i hear the word arrogant being thrown around and things like that but my take on him is actually he's, he's somewhat of a shy person also so it's not somebody that's overly outward and you know uh, like a typical latin person that's you know that is uh greet you with a big smile and a big hug and you know things like that and you you quickly become uh good friends you know and i think um he's a little bit more more closed off that way and and i i i perceived it as arrogance at first 
you know but then i then i i interpreted more as a little bit uh shyness also not not somebody that's um i think he just else. he just came in with a mindset like he's not there to make friends he's there to win world titles you know and and i think for many people i mean it's it's sort of a strength because imagine going on tour and not talking to anybody or not you know like just being so freaking focused it's something that goes against human nature for most people but the mindset that that he had was obviously a lot stronger than that that he could just yeah. shove it aside and yeah but yeah that, i think i think i think now we we you know as 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 the tour has has gone on and you see uh like the tour is quite interesting right now with how close a lot of the sailors are you know and it's 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 actually a very interesting study on the pwa tour because everybody's you know for the most part it's surprising how good uh friends people are you know of course not everybody you know and and, and we know there's there's very strong rivalries on the water that uh are also seen a little bit on land but for in general you know this is a quite a close knit family I think I think with Bjorn at the time it's what you said the guy was in there you know he was all business you know he he knew what he wanted to do and that was his primary goal and not that uh he's saying I'm not going to make friends but he's just focusing on what he's on what he's trying to do you know and and uh I think Bjorn's also developed incred- incredibly good friendships throughout the years you know you see that and um yeah and you so, have but to I think you, you you have to back it up because that's going to be seen as arrogant and I like you said I I study a lot of sports and I came with a sort of similar mentality but I was crap so everybody just hated that right you know what I mean it's it, you you got to back it up if if you if you're there just on business <laughs> he definitely did yeah. yeah and and he 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 backed it up better than probably anybody ever ever has in in this sport you know so you know he he accomplished what he needed to accomplish and one thing i learned from him is a lot of people i remember when we made the transition from going from custom boards to production boards one of the biggest arguments there was we're never going to be able to beat bjorn because he has that equipment advantage over us you know and this was actually a very strong reason why we went to uh production equipment you know because everybody's saying his budgets are bigger he can get you know he can show up at the beach with 30 boards and we're not going to be able to to beat them you know we can't compete like that but i remember the first years we we switched to production equipment and nothing changed he still kicked everybody's ass the same way you know so his his real strength you know when it comes down to this and now uh with what we're doing here in turkey with with training kids also his real strength is his mind you know it's it's you develop your skills to a certain extent you develop your knowledge but the higher that level goes then the smaller the differences are in speed and tactical ability and execution all that it comes down to your psyche you know and it comes down to your mind and you, you know you're beat, not you you can't beat the 64 best guys in the world on pure speed or pure jibing ability or pure it's he he, he did he actually did that for a long time but he he was i i tell you he was the strongest mentally uh mentally strongest sailor i've ever seen i've ever met you know he was he's you understand if 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 you've raced with him you've seen it you understand you're up against that so you can't have uh, this internal self doubt or questioning or anything like that and i think he had very very little of that Yeah, and the yeah. more he the more he won the more all the other guys um had that right i mean the famous interview the team just needs to work a little bit harder yeah yeah and i mean he let you know i guess he let you know yeah but this was you know i i i had i i won't talk about it but i've had a couple of occasions with bjorn where i saw him where he was battling with you know with uh antoine I remember when when Antoine started coming in and winning but there was there was a couple of occasions when when they were battling it out and it was coming down to the wire and and 
I understood his strength, his mental strength very clearly there. And I could see the contrast between the two sailors, you know, and then you understood, wow, this guy's, there's something else there. It's not just, it's not just his speed, not just his size, not just his ability. It's, it comes down to mental strength. And saying that, Antoine's incredibly mentally strong also. So, you know, he's, he's probably the second most uh, successful sailor in the sport, you know, in the sport's history, I think, with the number of world titles and all that. So yeah, they're, I think they're very different. They're just very different people, different sailors also in terms of style and ability. And it's just super hard to compare the two. And as you say, Antoine's, even though the age difference is not that big, Antoine's much more our generation it's incredible how young he acts actually uh you know for 47 years old he's still enjoying enjoying Ant that as, as antoine's, yeah antoine's a big kid isn't he yeah and it's uh, it's insane you know i remember um in in azores we would finish the racing and he would be like organizing a jet ski to go towing surfing and he would be so stoked and so motivated like like, in, it's insane, you know, at 45 at the time, whatever. Yeah, you know? yeah. But anyway, uh, going back to those, to those Bjorniers, who... Just, just, the point, just the point on that, Matchek, because I think, I think this, is very, this is very interesting, what you just said about Antoine, and I think, I think that's what's made Antoine and, and, and Bjorn so successful. I have this, I have this little story about um, when I went... Uh, when I went to North sales to, to, uh, to, I was in charge of the development of the sales and we were testing sales in the Canaries and Bjorn had switched from Neil Pride to North sales at the time. And I had to test these free ride sales, you know? So I went down to, to his school and, um, you know, I called him up. I said, Bjorn, I have some free ride sales I need to test. Can you, can you help me out with that? You know, and normally with Bjorn, I was just testing, you know, it, it was either the race sales or the wave sales at the time, you know? but he wasn't involved in the free ride testing so much, you know? So I go down to his place, you know, in, in uh, Playa Aguila to his school and rig up the sails, get everything ready and say, okay, you know, let's go out there. And we go out there and we test the sails, we switch sails, we go through the whole process. And I'm like, all right, that's it. You know, let's go back to the beach and finish it up. Free ride testing wasn't my favorite uh, thing to do, you know? It's the worst. Yeah, you know, you're not, it's not so interesting if you're a racer or, you know, the wave sails is, you know, the competitive equipment was really interesting to test, you know, but the other stuff you're not so interested in. And I remember Bjorn just kind of looked at me and goes, ah, you know, why don't we go upwind a little further, you know, and kind of looked down and went, okay, you know, and when we started just sailing, you know, we're done, we're just free sailing now. And I look over at him and he's just got this big smile on his face and we're just cruising around on free ride equipment and he's freaking loving it, you know? And I'm just like, what the hell? And I, all I want to do is go back to the beach, finish up my job, sort of speak, you know? But then I started thinking, this guy just loves being out on the water, you know? And I think the same thing with Antoine. He loves being out on the water. And I think that's a huge reason they're as successful as they are, you know? Some, I've seen over the years some sailors do all the right things, you know, but they do... I don't want to say the minimum, but what has to be done. They don't do more. Or you see that, you understand they're not out there going out for a cruise on a free ride sail or going out, you know, and after racing and doing all these other things. And I think the amount of time they spent on the water, the amount of time they spent exercising, doing these things that they're actually enjoying, they love it, you know. And I think the love of the sport is a huge, huge reason uh, for their success, you know. That's, that's a huge element in that whole equation which is quite a complex one actually but yeah it's anyway. uh, the, the 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 psychology in such a complicated sport as windsurfing you see you see Bjorn and Antoine or now Pierre and Matteo being such different people and being so successful and if you if you really dig into it I think in any sport you can see that, I mean, la The Last Dance is now uh, on Netflix and, and you can see right. Michael Jordan and, and these guys, you know, and Isaiah Thomas and Rodman, all being such completely different people from different places, being very, very successful in their own, on their own terms, in their own ways, right. you know? And like you say, you know, the 
probably the love for for the process is the only thing that kind of binds everybody together. That's a common element, isn't it? You know, yeah, it's very very hard to to win if you don't enjoy the process of yeah. of getting there. And and this is what I think a lot of people fail to understand. And a lot of and and it's actually not that easy. It's actually not that easy because many times you you've been to Tenerife with us. You know how physically straining it can be, and how you don't want to get out of bed sometimes. You know, and just finding some little things to to make your day. You know, and just it's yeah, it's it's very interesting. We could talk. We could we could do another show on on that. I think. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's a huge that's a huge part of it. As I said, you know, and I think now, um, like here at our center, we're training a lot of kids. You know, and I'm I'm. You, you start thinking about what it is that's making somebody uh, a good athlete, you know, and you understand the importance, the, the psychological aspect of it is, is hugely important. And you can teach people to go fast. You can teach people to drive. You can teach people how to start the technical aspects of, of, of racing and all that. But the psychological part of it cannot be ignored. You know, that's, that becomes, once you reach a certain level, that becomes 90% of it, you know. So. Yeah. Yeah, and I I don't know if I'm on that level yet, but I I can feel that and and recent, yeah. I just start thinking about it much more, being aware of it much more, and and the things you you see when you start actually paying attention, it's it's pretty incredible. I mean, yeah, you, I think you could copy everything Bjorn do, Bjorn did, and fail miserably, you know. Or copy all the things Antoine did because maybe it doesn't suit you or whatever, you know, it's, it's, there's just so many elements. Yeah, I mean, it'll get you probably 80, 85% of the way there. But it's that other, you know, you can even say, you can even argue, it's that other 2 or 3%, you know, that, that makes a, a difference. You know, I look, at, I look at, you know, I'm a big fan of the sport also. So I'm, I'm, I'm seeing, I'm observing... Uh, a lot of sailors, how they're going around about with their training, which is quite interesting now with this Instagram and Facebook and everybody's uh, detailing their training. Hey, it's not real. It's not more. real so, to me. Let me, let me just <laughs> break it down to you. No, but you, you understand. I understand. Um, you look at somebody like Matteo, for example, who's, who's, you know, been incredibly consistent the last several years. And he has that element of it also. I think you have that element of it also where you, you're enjoying uh, not only racing, you're enjoying wave sailing, you enjoy surfing, you know, you're enjoying different elements of it. And this is, this is a huge aspect of it. And, you know, I understand what you're saying about the Instagram thing about being real or not real, but you know, you, you, you understand when people are also actually doing things, you know, and I see, you know, I'll use Mateo as an example because he has that success uh, to go back on. And I, I get the sense that he has that, that very similar type of love for the, for the sport and for what he's doing that Antoine and, and Bjorn have or had, you know. So I think that's an element of success. I see that in you also, you know, and I think you're, you're you're getting very close probably to your goals i think you're doing a lot of a lot of the correct things you know and you can see that you're you're stoked with the process as you call it you know and definitely uh, such an interesting topic i mean and yeah it's just endless endless uh, endless uh, examples we could we could bring but um so basically you get back on tour bjorn's absolutely dominating who are the guys that are coming close to beating him? Does it ever come close? And why do they not beat him? Or for a 12-year stretch, why does he win absolutely everything? Freaking 12 years is a long time. Yeah. You know, I think, I think there was guys like Anders, who was famously second to him. And... Um, you know, I think that's a better question suited for Anders actually to answer, but I'm not gonna ask him. He's a big yeah. dude. <laughs> yeah, no, Anders is he's a great guy and, and but I I don't 
I, I don't have an answer for that, to be honest, you know, I, and I think it comes back a little bit to, to what I was saying. He was just, he was just training so hard and was so on it, you know, that he just wasn't leaving any room for anybody to do more, you know, and I think he, he was doing probably close to a hundred percent of what was possible to do at the time, you know, and, and Anders came close a bunch of times. Um, later on in in like i think course racing disciplines things like that i think micah was actually quite close you know kevin uh kevin and matt were were right there uh, kevin finally got it one year you know but that was a massive massive team effort you know four guys and a cell designer and four shapers and you know uh, just to go after one guy you know so i think it all goes back to to ultimately i think to to the strength of his of his psyche which also pushed him to train and do all the you know leave no rock unturned and we just haven't seen anybody that was able to dominate that much you know even as successful as Antoine's been it hasn't been that that dominating as as, as that stretch that Bjorn had. Paint us a picture um, about the gear war and and how much gear was involved developed maybe some numbers of boards that, that Bjorn was going through or, or the team was developing to beat him. Um, sale designers being present at event site, modifying sales, the amount of fins, just paint us a little picture. I know not being a top 10 sailor at the time, you know, I was spending, uh, what was it, twenty twenty five thousand dollars $25,000 a year on boards alone. You know, so all it was all custom boards. Um, I would go to every racing event with two board bags, four slalom boards minimum, four course racing boards. You know, so eight ba- eight boards. I was going to every racing event with, um, and I'm not a top ten sailor. You know, and that was, I think at the time Bjorn was. I don't know. You hear the stories of showing up at the beach with 25 boards, you know, and every board with a fin on it and things like that. I, I never, I never witnessed that part of things, but um, you know, the boards were just, it was just a constant evolution of, of equipment and, and everything was open. So you could use whatever you wanted, whenever you wanted, however much you wanted. And, and it didn't stop. Uh, it didn't stop uh, evolving. And sounds like it was quite an exclusive club. I heard a story from Andrea Kuki that never um, kind of made it in those custom days. He he was trying to raise production boards versus you guys on customs and couldn't get anywhere. And then he bought a custom of a Phil McGain and not knowing that Phil had sanded all the rails down not to be sharp basically sanded the board, I don't know, flat or into a different bottom shape or just sanded it randomly into bumps and bruises and whatever, that basically no one from the outside of the club could actually copy the, copy the design. I'm, I'm not sure Phil, I'm not sure Phil would actually do something like that, you know, but um, I think, I think it's a little bit now, it's, I think it's a little, little bit, um, wasn't so sinister, I think, <laughs> as you're making it out to be. But I think I think it's a little bit like what happens with carpenter fins, for example, now, you know. It's like you try to get a fin now, it's quite difficult, you know, not because he doesn't want to sell it to you or anything like that, just because there's so many orders and there's so many backlogs. And I think at the time, for example, with Alex, not everybody could buy Alex's board because there was a limit as to how many he could actually make by hand, you know, and already the guys that he had on the program that that was filling his time you know so he didn't have time to make you know perhaps for somebody like andrea you know maybe the same thing with phil but i can i can also see that maybe there was some uh protectionist action being taken you know if you're selling some stuff that really you didn't want somebody else to see you know i don't i don't know if he would do something so so randomly to make it to make something bad that he would sell, you know, but I think uh, at that period of time, there was a lot of uh, secrecy involved in the development of equipment. You know, it was incredibly rare to be able to 
for example, Mike and I were, were working with North Sales together at the time. It was incredibly difficult or rare that we could line up with Phil, who was, you know, with uh, Maui Sales. Uh, I think it was Maui Sales at the time, you know, to be able to line up even for 10 seconds to measure what we're working on, you know, how the sales are working or how anybody's speed is. Everybody was staying very far apart, you know, and just working together in teams. You know, you wouldn't let somebody come and, and line up next to you. You know what I mean? And that's, that's really funny, um, again, comparing these generations because um, right now, like, if we train together, if we do race simulation, nobody would be on their best gear, not because they don't want to show their speed, but just because they want to save their best mass and their best fins. Obviously, it's composite, so it might break, etc. But then um, Antoine, that obviously never trained with us, he really struggled to believe that we would do that because, first of all, they, he would struggle to believe that we're trained together so much. And then once it became obvious, he struggled to believe that we would do that because if you show, you want to freaking show strength. You know, you don't want to... It seems like it changed a lot from back then. Well, I think back then also you're developing all this equipment continuously, you know, so you don't want to show your cards. You don't want to show uh, how much improvement or how much evolution you, you've done, you know. You don't want to make the other guy, the other company work harder. You know, if, if you made big advances, you don't want to let somebody else know you've made those big advances until it's, you know, until you go to the races. So everybody was a little bit like that kind of, and, and I remember my, my heart rate would actually increase the first time I would line up with somebody else. And that was like, you've been working on developing these sales for, you know, three, four, five, six months. And, here, you know, here you are, here comes the moment of truth. You come together and line up and, you know, what happens if this guy just completely burns you, you know, you're just like, Ah, it didn't work. We just we messed up, you know. Kind so, of Formula One, Formula One test preseason testing type moment. Yeah. So it, it it was quite radical that whole period, and and yeah, nobody ever came together, you know. And people were training, you know, even in Hawaii, where there's, uh, you know, you go to Kanaha, you can either go a little bit upwind or a little bit downwind, or go down to the harbor or whatever it was. You know, everybody was spreading out pretty much and yeah, the whole beach in Kanaha is maybe what like 500 meters to maybe a kilometer and you would have to fit how many teams like big teams yeah you know there could be three or four different you know it could be Neil Pride, Maui Sales, North Sales you know they're all there trying to develop their stuff and everybody's you know you see the sale designers are all there with their binoculars looking at at, at everybody else's stuff and you know you're you're nobody's really coming to you up close on the beach and looking at your sail. Everybody was pretty respectful also in that, in that respect. But yeah, I remember a couple of times trying to sail with, with Phil or Kevin, you know, I would just go down and, and sit, line up right next to them and immediately people would sheet out, you know, it's like, yep, this, this is not going to happen. You just kind of sit there for a couple of seconds realizing, you know, nobody would say anything like get out of here or anything like that. But, yeah. They would just sheet out and then you get a hint and say, okay, but it's not going to happen. So let's, let's go, you know, whereas now it's, it's a lot more open, but I think what's happened in Tenerife is, is very interesting and, and great movie that you did the other day um, that you released the other day on that whole evolution of the thing. But essentially this, this was a little bit uh, what the team did at the time, you know, with Phil McGain and, and Scott Fenton and the Pritchard brothers, you know, they got together and they said, but you know, we can, we can uh, improve a lot better if we work together. And that's essentially what's happening in, in Tenerife and especially at the beginning, you know, I think when Andrea tried to bring the whole point seven team together there and, and improve the whole point seven team, you know, I think that was a, that, that's the correct model to use. And now the interesting part is that it's just a bunch of, it's not anybody from a team, you know? It's, yes. It's very it's interesting. It's a collaboration. It's collaboration between sailors, you know, and it's, it's proven an incredibly effective model to, to, uh, 
to get results. You know, you guys are, you guys are doing it. You guys are getting the results and there's, there's no questioning, uh, you know, the method there. So. Yeah. I think back then it was also a lot different because there was so much more, uh, gear, the speed differences. If I watch a race from back then and I see Bjorn starting five seconds late and arriving to the first mark first, that doesn't happen today, no matter who you are. Like, I put my number three fin and Antoine is on his best gear. He starts five seconds late. There's no chance he gets, and I'm not even, I'm not even his competitor. I'm fighting to, you know, maybe get one podium in the whole, in my whole career so far. And he's winning world titles. We're not even in the same league. And that doesn't happen. And I think that's a lot of people fail to, to understand that, you know, they think it's like back in the days where, where the speed differences were a lot bigger and probably the significance of the racing elements was a lot smaller. So the thing we do in Tenerife has a lot more importance in, in today's era. Yeah. Yeah. My okay. question to you is you have, you have a number three fin. How many fins do you have? A lot. <laughs> too many. <laughs> Way too no, many. I think, I think that's that, you know, that's a little bit what was happening with the equipment wars, you know, and it's like, um, you know, even, even when, when we switched to production equipment, you know, I was getting my board allotment was quite big. You know, I think maybe at one point it was something like 20 boards a year, you know, and then I would pick out, you know, three or four of the same model. And then I would just pick out the fastest one. And that one would, you test all four boards, three or four boards of the same model, and you put the best one away and only for the races. And, you know, yeah, that yeah, was... Yeah, not confuse anybody. The gear war is still on. Yeah. It's just... It, it is. It is, and it's, and, it's, and it's a little bit different, you know, but I think that's, that's what was happening there, and, and I think at the time it was more difficult to, to get the equipment. Now you get can... In, you, you get into the war, to get into the battle, even. Yeah. Well, now you can order. If you, if you, have, the, if you have the budget, you can order you know, four or five boards, you know, if you want to get 485s, then you can do it, you know, whereas back then, if you wanted to order four or five boards, you couldn't necessarily physically get them, you know, they weren't available to you, you know. Yeah, but you still, like, still today, if you want to, if you want to order a 490 with a 76 top, you probably need to have an in at the factory or, or be properly sponsored, but yeah. Yeah, I think I think with yeah, I, and this is the advantage the top sailors have right now is is um, you know I think it's difficult to get these custom masks. You know I think it's it's unless you're in the development team and uh, it's quite difficult to get them. But just it's it is an advantage to be able to sift through you know four five six ten four nineties and pick out the magic one. You know this is possible for the top riders that, that have a bigger budget or bigger equipment allotment than it is for the lower rank sailors. So there's still that equipment battle and the equipment differences there, but it's, you it's available. Mask. You never know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. So, so there was, you mentioned the money. There was a lot, a lot of money involved. How did that rub off on the sailors? Cause the picture our generation gets, is sort of a rock and roll lifestyle on tour is that of course mo maybe more so in the waves or the early freestyle days than the racing but still how, how was that in from your memory I, I look some guys some guys were making good money and by good money i mean they were probably uh had contracts that were worth over a hundred thousand dollars a year from <laughs> You know, maybe they had two or three sponsors like that. Um, you know, I don't know exactly how much uh, people like Robbie or, or Bjorn made and things like that. But I know what was offered to me from time to time, you know, and, and, and the money was much better. But I don't think uh, it's accurate also to say that there was a huge amount of money going around because it's never been a sport uh, comparable to football or anything like that. And I don't think we can talk in the millions um this well, kind I think, of i think the value of money has changed and let's maybe compare to like you could probably uh buy buy a house with one year's contract whereas now it probably takes a lot longer than that 
again, I think there was a few guys that were able to, to make some really good money, you know, uh, the very, very top guys that, that were able to get money from the sales sponsor, from a board sponsor, you know, some and outside industry. the industry, the sport was a it, lot bigger as well, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, so there was probably guys that were able to make, you know, two, three hundred thousand dollars a year. But I don't think it was also so, so many guys uh, being able to do that, you know. So I, I think I think it's a little bit exaggerated what people um, people believe um, how much money was going around at the time. You know? But I, I, I don't think I was asking about the numbers specifically, but maybe more about the lifestyle, the rock and roll. I know your wife is probably sitting somewhere, so you're not going to mention all the groupies or anything, but... But there was an element of that having a lot, having a lot of media, having TV, uh, at events, uh, just uh, and and it was an era where where not everybody could be a celebrity on Instagram. It was an era where you actually to get famous, you needed, um, yeah, just different. It was just different ways, right? And yeah, I think. And guys, where I mean, until this day, Robbie comes to Silt. I, I I walk down the street in Silt, and there's this like crowd of people. I thought somebody died or something in the middle, and there's Robbie signing autographs and saying, uh, you know, and just speaking German to the guys, you know, right in the middle of the street. So, yeah, I think I think in Europe the sport the sport grew so much in Europe, and I think at one point they did a poll in Germany, and and uh, they asked who you know. Uh, a poll about who the most popular athletes or, or recognized people in Germany, something like that. And I think Robbie was number three or something like this, you know, after Boris Becker and, and Robbie somebody Becker else. Power, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, 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 or maybe, uh, yeah, you know, a football player or a Formula One driver. What's his name? Uh, Mikhail Schumacher. Yeah. Yeah. I think actually it was, it was, he was behind uh, Schumacher and Boris Becker at the time, you know, which were global celebrities. You know, so that's how big the sport was at the time in, in Germany and throughout Europe, I think in Holland also. So I think uh, Bjorn and, and Robbie and Robert Territao and Anders Bringdahl, you know, and, and uh, I think especially Robert and, and Anders, they had that rock star personalities also. And I think that brought up a lot of those images that you're talking about. Yeah, for sure. We remember the most... Um like the most extreme cases right yeah. i remember i don't know robert jumping off the big ship and just being a total rock star in, in bercy jumping out of the pool and you know waving at the crowd and pulling chicks out of the crowd and whatever right i mean <laughs> this is i think you know this is what what you remember you probably wouldn't remember the you know bjorn and bench pressing for 20 minutes in a video or whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. so i think that's that's maybe where it comes from but so anyway back to you you actually did a lot of your best results in your kind of late 40 late 30s sorry <laughs> back when i was 50 <laughs> late 30s even early 40s and i remember my first kind of proper sponsor on tour that that gave me an insight was patrick um which was colorful as you can probably imagine and yeah. he, he always told me every time we would test something and i would be like patrick but this is so much faster he would go like yeah you know speed is speed but in the end jimmy is third in the world <laughs> <laughs> so so tell us tell us how how did you manage at at 175 you're, you're about that, right? Like uh, 175 cm, not not the most. No, I'm not 175. I'm like, what am I? I'm 5'10". 5'10", 178, something like 178. this. 178. Anyway, not something that you would think like, oh, this guy is probably huge and fast and whatever. You manage to score multiple podiums, come third in the world for multiple years. Um, so, so what was your thing? How, how did you manage to actually get those results? Well, I didn't, I didn't have so, so many podiums also. Um, but I think uh, my, my biggest thing, I think my biggest 
my biggest flaw or my biggest deficit was my boat speed. You know, I was never so, so fast. So it wasn't like I could come off the line, hit the buoy first and, and getting to the buoy first was always my big problem. You know, I couldn't get there first. It makes life know? a lot easier, doesn't it? Once you do it. <laughs> if, 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 if I'm ahead, I know how to keep people from passing me. So I think my, my biggest strength was I was tactically, I was always thinking on the race course, you know, and, and a lot of people, a lot of people, especially that have course racing experience, kind of look at slalom and say, okay, and all that, but there's so many freaking tactics involved in it. And I think my biggest strength was that I was able to, um, I was able to, in a way, kind of slow down the race and see what was happening and how things were going to develop in front of me. And I, th I think my biggest strength was the first and second jive, you know, and I was able to tactically approach those, even though not in first place, I was able to get out of there in pretty in qualifying position, you know, so you have to be top four. And I was, I was able to you know, uh, often get there. You know, I remember one race in New Caledonia coming back to the beach, you know, I think the, not, not last year, but the year before. So it's first time I went to New Caledonia that we went over there. Um, I came to the beach and Micah came up to me. He's like, how the hell did you qualify? You know, he's like, I saw you way in the back, last something. He's like, how the hell did you qualify? How, 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 I don't understand. You know, and, and I think my strength was not being able to get off the line so quick. This was my big weakness, but my strength was that first jive and being able to accelerate quickly. So I didn't have a very high top speed, but my acceleration to probably about 85, 90% was pretty good. And I knew, how to, I knew how to close gaps. And in my mind, what I always said is just get me within one or two seconds of that first mark or get me within one or two seconds of that guy in front of me, and I'll probably be able to pass him, even though his boat speed, his top end speed is faster than me. So I think I was able to accelerate quicker, and I was able to jibe technically a lot of times better than the people around me, but also tactically better. So I would never, I would seldomly put my, take myself out of the race. I would always be in the race, even in, into that last jibe. And I don't know how many times I came into that last drive in fifth position and was able to get out of there, you know, in fourth. But like, a to fifth. The next round. like a close fifth, fifth. Very. Breathing, breathing down the neck of the guy, putting pressure on him and psychologically using, it's almost an advantage. I mean, I wouldn't say it's an advantage, but it's, if you put pressure, anyone, anyone, I don't care who it is, I've seen the best of the best make mistakes while under pressure. And if you don't put pressure, I mean, we all can jibe. Everybody on tour can jibe alone, you know, but once it gets down to that last mark, semi-final, make the final or not, you know, and probably the guy with 20 years more experience, you probably put your money on him, which would be you because you, you managed to get also great longevity without injuries and being kind of where do you think your peak was what what age probably the, the 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 podiums i got in korea and vietnam you know i think i think uh 2010 that was 11 10 probably, yes 2011 2012 something like that i can't even remember i'm i'm, I'm really bad at that but um yeah, so you are in your. I mean, this is this is this is a little bit the beauty of the sport is is it's you can practice it for quite long and now now I understand you know your, your mind I'm 52 now and your mind is still there your mind is still telling you you can do it and then and then your body kind of tells you no you can't anymore you know but this is this is how how nice it is I think for windsurfing and and that I think realistically you can compete in, into your 40s in windsurfing in slalom you know not in freestyle but um and it's it's rare for any sport 
to be able to compete that long. You know, if you're in, playing in the NBA, by the time you're 35, you're, you're really looking at retirement quite soon, you know. So, but windsurfing, shit, it's almost like golf. You can keep doing it for quite a long time. Look at Antoine. He's what, 46, 47, 48 now? Yeah. And, he, you know, he's still top three in the world. Jesus, that's, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah. I think as long as your body can, you can manage your body well and still have that passion that we talked about earlier. I think these are the two things that probably fade uh, the earliest. Looking back at your strictly your racing career, do you think that you could have done a lot better? Have, if you know now what you know back then, you know, back then what you know now. Yeah, a hundred, a hundred percent. Um, and you talk about injuries and all and things like that, but I, I, I actually had numerous injuries, uh, throughout my career that were quite, um, chronic, you know, the biggest one is my back. Yeah. Yeah. Not, it's not even, you know, nagging is to put it mildly, you know, but I remember early on when I first went to Hawaii, um, or the second time I went to Hawaii, really after university, I said, okay, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm in a hundred percent and I would go sailing all day. And then I'd go to the gym. There's a gold, gold's gym in, in Wailuku. And we'd go in there and just stupidly pump weight. And, you know, I tore both my rotator cuffs, bench pressing and, you know, just doing a lot of stupid things. And for, for several months, I couldn't lift my, my arms above my shoulder, you know, above my head because of the torn rotator cuffs and everything that happened. Then I had really bad back injuries where, you know, I, I, I could almost not walk, you know, and I, I would go almost crawling to the, to the chiropractor because my back was locked up. And, and this is, this is something I, I, could, I suffered to this day. And, I had a torn meniscus also competed with that in Fuerte one year and, and, you know, it was just, it was hell. Um, so I've had some injuries and, and I think looking back, one of the things I would do is early on get a proper personal trainer to, to teach me how to train and how, you know, how to do it properly. And it wasn't until I was able to join the MPG program and train with Scott Sanchez that I started learning properly about how to train so this was a which big doesn't thing. mean which doesn't mean you weren't sore or getting slightly injured i mean do you know any professional slalom sailor that doesn't have a sore back from time to time i, I know not being able to get out of bed is a different story but these are the type of injuries everything you listed bad shoulders bad back it's kind of what you know my generation that we have the best care personal trainers etc cetera, etc cetera. you know we still I, I think it, i think for example i i when i went to hawaii and i'm working out at the gold's gym there and you know i'm just stupidly in my mind believing i need to push as much weight as i can and physically what happens is your your muscle fibers develop quicker than what your tendons or your, or your joints uh, at a slower rate than, than what your tendons or your joints can, can withstand, you know? So physically you can push that weight, but your, you know, your, your system can't handle it. And I ended up tearing my rotator cuffs because of that. If you have a personal trainer, if you know this stuff beforehand, you won't try it. You build up a base over time and then, and then start building up the muscles uh, accordingly, you know? So things like this, it was, it wasn't day to day sailing. It was doing stupid things. You know, I would, one of the things I learned to do quite late was actually take a day off from sailing to have a rest day where you don't do anything and let your body regenerate. So when I was in charge of the development programs, for example, for, with Neil pride and, and North sales, I was sailing seven days a week the whole time, you know, I wasn't stopping and it was, I was spending so much time on the water. Rigging. My body wasn't resting. You know, I'd wake up, I'd go to the gym, go to the beach, train, develop sales, rig sales, you know, continuously be on the water, get out of the water, go for a bike ride, you know, come home, probably eat deficiently. You know, it was just a, a, not the proper way to do it. And if I were to go back, I would take a very, very close look at that from the beginning you know, either learn about it or hire 
a, a personal trainer, probably a nutritionist. If I had the money, I would have hired a sports psychologist also, you know. So I look at my career and there's, there's a ton of things I could have done much, much better, you know. Um, and it, for sure, I would have gotten much better results as, as, um, as it stands, you know. And, and I think that's the thing. I see, I see you guys now. I see you guys now and doing all the training. I, I, I'm very impressed with the training you're doing, even though sometimes I question whether it's more applicable to a basketball sailor or a windsurfer. Um, it, get, you know, it, gets, it gets click on, clicks on Instagram. As I told you, don't yeah. believe everything you see on Instagram. I do a yeah. lot more basic squat. I'm not going to put my squats and deadlifts on, on uh, you know, or my yoga, which is very, very bad. Yeah. You know, but I think that's that's one of the beauties now is is um, you know every every generation is is hopefully getting better, um, and you're you're building on 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 what the previous generation learned and all that. And I think this generation, your generation, for example, is is training a lot in 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 a much more educated way. You know, a lot of you guys are doing that. You know, you see everybody's so many of you guys have a personal trainer um, and doing things correctly, you know, and this is this is making the big difference. I think this is what Bjorn was doing. Also, he was training incredibly out of the water. And I think he was one of the first guys to to one of the first windsurfers to recognize the importance of that. And, and he kept that totally to himself. Not very many people understood what he was yeah. doing, you know. Yeah. But now you see more and more, and, and, and I think this generation knows a hell of a lot more about nutrition and training than what, what we knew, you know. You've been involved in R&D a lot in, in development research and, dev, re, research and development a lot uh, over your years, and, and you already answered that, that it kind of hindered you. And, and this is what I think the biggest misconception is. I think people think that, that Antoine develops the new pride sales and and Matteo develops the Severns and, um, and Pierre de develops the North Sales, the, sorry, the, du the Duotones. Um, of course, they are involved, but they are not main people behind it just because of that time factor that you mentioned that they want to train and they want to be. Um, and many, many times also, these guys are fast on everything. So uh, probably a guy like, myself or, or you that probably don't have the the super you know extra six gear speed have actually much bigger differences when when testing right on a on a on good gear you can go as fast as Antoine but on the bad one you know what I mean like uh, yeah I've, I've always believed I've always believed that the let's say the sailors like Bjorn and, and Antoine Micah's uh, their margin of error is much uh, smaller in terms of if they don't put, you know, if they're missing half CM of downhaul, they may not necessarily get affected to it too much, you know, whereas if I miss half CM of downhaul, my speed is finished. You know what I mean? So yeah, they exactly can get right. away with a little bit. Yeah. So there, there's that element of it. Um, but I think I think uh, what I saw what I saw uh, working with with Neil Pride and North Sales, the the smartest way to develop equipment you got to put somebody in charge of that, you know, and you got to uh, strategically allocate your team guys to do what they do best, you know. So if you have somebody like Bjorn, you don't want him developing the free ride sales, wasting his time developing the free ride sales when he can be training his, for his racing or for his competition. But what you want to do is use him when you're developing the racing sales to give you the input on how the equipment is going. No? So my position with both Neil Pride and North later on was I was the one that was in charge of developing the sales and working with the different people which was an incredibly interesting experience because I, I, I managed to work with, I think, a lot of the top guys throughout my career, you know, in developing the equipment. And it was like working with Bjorn on development of the race sales with Micah, Andre Springdahl, 
even Patrice Belbelk early on when I first uh, went on uh, to Neil Pride in the wave sales with Jason Polakow and freestyle sales with Josh Stone. Um, you know, so a lot of the, w w with Antoine also in developing the sales. So a lot of the, the top guys I managed to, to work with, but th that's the way you got to do it. If you're developing the whole line, get your top sailors to help you develop what they're the best at. So I'm not going to grab Jason again and, you know, have him do some race runs with me or, or on the free, on the freestyle sales, even, you know, we're going to go to Hukipa and we're going to, look at the sales there and try them out together with him. So this, this is the way you develop the sales. And I think what you were talking about with Pierre and Matteo, you know, they got with duo tone, Marco's in charge of that, you know, and I think he's, he's doing a lot of, uh, let's Our say the light work. That is, yeah. You know, and, and, and then you bring in Pierre to, to test specifically that sale and, and to give the input uh, on the whole thing. And I think that's the way it probably works with Matteo also, you know, I think, uh gonzalo probably is doing a lot of leg work there with those sales i think you know and and i think that's the proper way to structure the program but you got to put somebody in charge of the whole thing and that somebody can't necessarily be the sale designer that's the next step yeah going forward. How, how much how much uh, influence or how much of the final product is the designer and how much is the writer if you have to give a percentage because I have a take on this, and I wonder if you, if if your one is is similar to. Well, me. if you ask, if you ask the, if you ask the sailor, it's the sailor probably about ninety percent, designer ten. And if you ask the designer, it's the other way around. You know, <laughs> I think. Um, look, I think it's the designer probably. With let's just take the race sales. You know, I think the designer is probably getting the sale, eighty-five to ninety-five percent there. You know, you have you start with the basic structure, the basic. Uh, plan of the sale and then you start tweaking it um, and it's quite easy to take quite a good sale and make it a, a sale that's not going to be competitive you know this can happen so incredibly easily so that extra 10 15 percent is the key to getting a successful race sale out on the market you know so both both are incredibly important you know but i think i think the the sale designer is 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 by far most of it but the sale cannot be successful without that extra 10 15 percent that the sailors are going to bring into that well that i would probably sense? put i would probably put a higher number than 10 percent, but i have the, a similar idea that um the the sale designer has his concept and the way the sale feels uh, in general, whether it's, you know, a lot of love curves, certain designers, they have certain ideas and they kind of stick to them, right? You cannot come in and just change the whole concept, like Luke Robert or Luke Kai. Now I come and we're going to do this. But that sale that comes out, that first prototype, probably it's enough to get you into the race but then the the actual all you know to win the race you need you need those riders right to to push in the, the correct direction you don't have good riders you're not going to come out with a good sale i'm 100 percent convinced of that there's no way it doesn't matter it doesn't matter who you are as a sale designer you know you need you need that that final confirmation of things you need the final uh five ten fifteen percent whatever you want to call yeah, it because you know, the concept could be great but if it doesn't release enough for example exactly. it's not going to go fast exactly and but this is the big... and the sale designer is not just taking your uh, your experiences which is robert straw and kai hopf uh, robert very good sailor but he's he's not racing size and then kai is kind of the opposite is you know he's well in the hundred kilo range probably <laughs> so so he would have kind of the opposite feeling if he goes on the water right but so 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 talking talking about that because you're on Neil Pride and year two thousand or two thousand one this guy called Robert Stroy comes in 
And what, what was your impression of him? Because he's not necessarily a guy, like you wouldn't meet him on the street and think like, oh, he's, he's a windsurfer. He's more of a designer slash crazy scientist slash, you know, he's, he's kind of that kind of guy. What, what was your first impression of him working with Niels Rosenblatt before and, and having Robert? Uh, that, that's actually quite a good question. You know, when, when, um, when I first went to Neil Pride, um, then I, it was with Nils, no? Nils, Nils was working there, and, and I like Nils a lot. The guy's uh, incredibly smart, you know? Actually, all the sale designers are incredibly smart. These guys are, are all really, really sharp. But I, I enjoyed working a lot with Nils. He's, he's very witty, and, and uh, he has that sarcastic sense of humor that I tend to have also. And, and so I was, I was really excited to work with, with him on, on things. And I was actually quite disappointed when, when things changed there at Neopride, to be honest with you. And then, as you said, this guy, Robert Stroy, came in, and I, I'd never heard of him before. You know, so I was I was a little bit surprised, and and um, he came from ART, didn't he? More working with Monty Spindler in ART. Yeah, he, exactly. So he was he was he was working with Monty, who's another great sail designer. You know, and and um, but I I'd never heard of him. I didn't know what was happening so much with ART at the time. So I didn't know he had been working with them and all that. And suddenly he came in and. Uh, personally, I was a little bit sorry to lose Nils there because I knew how talented he was, and, and personally, I liked him quite a bit. And but uh, soon after Robert came in, you know, then I could. Uh, I think it took me a little while to begin to understand him, you know, and 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 um, I was a little bit skeptical, probably, because I didn't know who he was, you know, and and suddenly it's like you're you're you'd been working with somebody like uh, Larry Herbig at North Sales and, and Kai and, and you knew, you know, Barry, you, you see Barry working around all the time. And then yeah, you're suddenly... established. You're already established and he's kind of a new guy, let's say. I, 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 I wouldn't look at it that way, but I just didn't know who he was. And I knew, I knew all the other good sale designers around. So I didn't know suddenly this guy came into Neopride, the, the biggest company at the time you know, and suddenly he's in charge of, of the sale development. So I was a little bit apprehensive, but it didn't take long to, to, to understand that he's also uh, incredibly smart and talented and, and he's got a lot of sharp ideas uh, going on. And um, I remember we struggled with the first sale, um, getting the first sale, trying to, you know, we didn't use any of the of the Nils designs and, and just started off with his designs. And that was a little bit of a struggle to get those two to work the way we wanted them to, you know, and I think, uh, God, at the time we went to the world championships in, I think it was in Thailand in, 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 uh, Pattaya for the formula worlds was the first, uh, ones we used with our, with the RS designs and they weren't so, so good. These were also the big, 10, 11, 12 meter sales and all well, that. They still won though, right? Didn't they? I mean, Voitech no, I think uh, Voitec, Voitec won on a different model, was it? Or it was a completely modified model? I can't remember. I can't remember exactly. Yeah, it was not production sales at that time. It's no. Formula Winter. No. Actually, until this day, it's not, it's still not production yeah. sales. In, in, uh, so there was, there was a little period of adaptation there, um, from my side anyway, you know, and, and I think Robert just came in and, and just took charge quite, quite quickly in, in terms of, I think for him, he, he seemed quite clear in terms of what he wanted to do and all that. And I was just trying to, uh, to, to go with it, you know, to, to try to support uh, him and, and the designs and try to um, make them as best as we could, you know, and I think that was the way to move forward. It wasn't something that, that uh, we were fighting or, or there was a conflict or anything like that. And, and we just try to move forward from, from, you know, where, where we stood, you know, it's like he came in as a sale designer and, and uh, actually at that point I was only helping Nils with the race sales, you know, and it wasn't until Robert came in, we worked on the race sales and then I think shortly after he, he, you know, he said, can you, can you do the whole line? Can you be in charge of the whole line? You know? Well, now that we have the introductions done, 
Jesus. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, so in 2005, you get elected president and uh, elected president of the PWA or the chairman of the PWA. Is that the correct title? Um, and you've told me personally a funny story how that, or not a funny, quite an interesting story, how that came about with, um, with a certain event. And why don't, you, why don't you give us a rundown how, how you went from basically being one of the sailors to all of a sudden sort of running the show? You know, if, if, if you're correct in the 2005 time, me being, becoming president, um, because I can't remember those dates so well. Um, around, around that period, uh, for some reason or another, I was getting approached by a lot of the organizers um, just at events. You know, they would, for some reason, come up to me because I wasn't on the management board or, or anything like that. And they would just say, look, we're, we're having some issues. You know, uh, things are not running so smooth uh, with the management and, and you know, and they would just start. You, you speaking uh, perfect Spanish had had a lot to do with that, right? We're talking. Well, it wasn't Spanish. only it was it wasn't only the organizers in 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 the in the Canaries. It was other organizers also. You know, like I remember going to Hungary one year, and and the organizer coming to me there and and talking, and um, so suddenly I started opening my eyes a little bit more towards how the things were being run and the relationships that the that that we were having as an association with the organizers and it came to a head in, in one year in Gran Canaria where we had a problem a conflict with um with trying to get a tour sponsor for the PWA and how that tour sponsor was uh, a competitor of one of the event sponsors and that whole situation was extremely mismanaged let's say and everybody from both sides was was um i think handled the situation uh not so well because it exploded you know and it really looked like at that point that we were going to lose another event and well, that was that nasty coming in as a as a as a tour exactly sponsor. Yeah, so we that in that year, Nesty was going to come in and possibly become a tour sponsor, and this was going to be a test event for them, and they were going to reevaluate after this event and and perhaps uh, dive into the whole tour. You know, so it was quite important for us, but unfortunately, it was in you know a direct competitor of of uh, of one of the sponsors for the event in the Canaries. So the organizers obviously weren't weren't uh, happy, and yeah. <laughs> And, and they blew up, we blew up, you know, and, and I was sitting at a restaurant there, uh, El Viento, I think, and, you know, drinking a coffee or something. Somebody comes running in and says, Jimmy, 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 you gotta, you gotta, you gotta come help us. These guys are going to start, you know, hitting each other or something like this, you know, and I'm like, what? And, and, um, you know, we we went over there, and the situation was extremely. And and I, because I know Spanish, then then um, I, I could go in there and and you know ease the tensions. I guess I don't know. Um, but it was after all that that I that I understood um, that things were not looking so good for us as an association, and that uh, a lot of the relationships were strained. And we needed to do something about it, you know. And I think also we were able to recognize that Phil had put in quite a lot of years uh, into the PWA, and I think he made a lot of sacrifices for the PWA also, and and did a really good job, you know. And and but I think he was probably starting to burn out on it, you know. And and um, I think I think know, we, should, we should actually fill in. What, what actually happened and how did the association come uh, of that structure? Because in the golden years, it was run by a media agency called SSM, right? And then that went south for financial or I don't want to, let's say, pinpoint anything because I wasn't there, but there was some 
let's say, not very legal activity or whatever, and that went down and the sailors actually took over the control of the, what was then being renamed the PWA, right? Right, so I think, I think Bill, perhaps Bill that's... McCain being kind of the experienced guy and, you know, really well anchored in the industry, he, he became chairman. Yeah, I think maybe we, we, we should take it back a little bit more even to the days that it was called WSMA, which is the World uh, Sailboarding Manufacturers Association, no? And that was the original start of a professional tour. And that's basically, you know, a sport getting uh, evolving, getting more and more popular. All this equipment's coming on board. Everybody's selling a lot of money and the manufacturers coming together and saying, let's do the logical thing here and promote this thing better. We need a professional tour, you know, and they come together and pull their resources and develop a tour. That then grew into, you know, what later on became the PBA um, managed you know, then it wasn't the industry, then it became something managed by a marketing company, as you say. And all the problems that came along with it, suddenly we went from a tour that was managed by the industry, opening up things for people to believe that the industry's taking advantage of the sailors, so kind of a union type of thing, then it being handled by uh, a marketing agency and then allegations of corruption and this kind of thing, mismanagement. And again, the sailors being taken advantage of to an association that was like, all right, let's do a collaboration between the sailors and the industry, you know, but let's make sure the sailors have a bigger say in this whole thing so that the sailors don't get exploited or don't feel exploited. And that's how we came to, modern day PWA. So we have now an association run by a management board, four sailor representatives and three industry representatives, you know, and it's called the Professional Windsurfers Association. But I think it's important to stress here also that this is a big collaboration between professional sailors and the windsurfing industry, you know, so it's not solely professional sailors here. So you're, so you're the president or the chairman. Um, what, I think a lot of people wonder, what does actually the president of the PWA do? What kind of function that is in theory and what it is in reality? Well, it's, it's the chairman of the, of the management board, yeah, and the president of, of the association. So in theory, uh, as a chairman of management board, you're, you're, you're overseeing um, the, the management board. You're, you're the head of the management board, uh, uh, managing the communication between the management board and how we're running the association, let's say. Um, what my job is in 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 the PWA is basically overseeing the operation of 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 the association. You know, we we are structured um, in a way that we have this seven person management board, but the PWA is largely a lot of the footwork, or let's say most of the footwork, is done by our tour manager. Rich Page, as you know, so he's been he's been with the PWA now, I think, for 27 years. So Rich is doing uh, the job of three or four people, probably, in the PWA, and this is something um, also that people people perhaps don't see uh, so much with the PWA that we are probably a smaller uh, entity than what most people believe us to be. You know, so we have this management board that's changing a lot from year to year. We get uh, four sailor representatives getting voted in or out uh, every year. The same with the possibility for the president, actually. So we have these uh, these elections every year. Um, the mat the industry is is uh, 
every two or three years, they have elections on who they elect to represent the industry side of things. But my job is, uh, is overseeing running the association. You know, what, what, what does that mean? That means, uh, first of all, working very closely with Rich. Um, Rich is in charge of many aspects of, of the association, including um, negotiating a lot of contracts with organizers, coordinating uh, the media aspect of it, coordinating the judges, uh, the rules, um, you know, all, all aspects of the association there. And my job is, is overseeing uh, and strategizing how we're going to, coming up with a strategy on how we're going to run and adapt and move forward with the association. Is that is that vague enough of a of an answer? That's super vague. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so basically you get up in the morning, you open your laptop and you just solve problems. Is that is that a correct or do you do you do you support rich in solving day to day problems and then you represent the PWA where it needs to be represented? I'm also the, let's say, the the representative of the PWA when we go face. to events. We have to give speeches, the face of the PWA, this kind of thing when at events and things like that. That's that's the that's a little bit the the least of it. Um, for example, for example, uh, yesterday, what did I do yesterday? You know, I had uh, conversations uh, over the phone with. Um, uh, the representative of I, the president of IWA were discussing uh, more collaborations between the PWA and IWA and IFCA and Formula Windsurfing. Um, you know, I wrote a couple of letters uh, to some of the sailors that need um, that need some certification from the PWA to allow them to sail now during the the pandemic. Um, we're dealing with a situation with uh, world sailing. So there was discussions with Rich uh, about that, about our situation, what's going on. There's, I had to write some emails also to one of our organizers in the Canaries event because uh, they're dealing with some things for government subsidies um, for the sailors and uh, getting officially recognized and certified through their federation, through their national federation and through world sailing, um, preparing some documentations also for some, some of the sailors that are applying for some visas. Um, also spoke to Matthias in Zilt uh, about the event in Zilt this year. You know, so it's it's things like that. You know, we're we're talking about what to do right now um, with the pandemic, with what's happening, what direction we're going to take, where we need to be, looking at our budgets, seeing how much uh, understanding, trying to understand how much uh, we can handle in terms of sustaining what we have without having events, uh, sustaining our crew to be able to start up on a moment's notice. Um, you know, we're we're and maybe take take rich. the people because I understand how it how it actually works and how the PWA is making money and able to afford a chairman and tour manager, a couple other people that work for you. So basically, uh, is it correct that you sell events to organizers? You sanction or you work with organizers and you sanction those events, and that's the way the PWA makes money and is able to afford staff and this basically day-to-day -day yeah. I mean very very openly and I think this is perhaps this is perhaps an interesting an interesting one for the general public to understand because of for whatever reasons you know we we and I don't know if it's a lot but for 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 whatever reasons we do get a lot of criticism you see it on Facebook and and I think people don't understand how we function so maybe that's our fault in, in not communicating it better or or if we need to communicate that to the general public or not. But I mean, basically what we are is we, we are uh, a tour organizer where we sanction events. So, in, in, and in order to be a sanctioned PWA event, you have to meet certain criteria regarding uh, prize money and, and um, sailor standards, you know, which include things like uh, free accommodation for the top, 16 men, 
uh, top eight women, uh, transportation from the airport, uh, meals, uh, prize money, storage, storage for equipment, you know, the prize money. You know, there's a whole list of things to do. Uh, there's a whole list of requirements for uh, an event to become uh, to be sanctioned by the PWA and become part of the PWA tour. So our job is to is to uh, try to get those events to come to the PWA tour and, and get them to to uh, fulfill all those requirements and, and to develop this tour. But we actually don't own the events, um, which makes it a complication for us in terms of being able to secure a tour sponsor. Because I think, for example, if you look at the surfing tour, um, you know, I think they own most of their events and they're structured in a much different way. You know, I think they have, uh, it's not run, it's not an organization run by sailors or surfers. It's, it's actually uh, run by uh, professionals, I think. Um, they have investments, they have huge uh, amounts of, of money invested into the tour, whereas we're completely self-sufficient, you know, we're generating our income. Our income comes from three different places. It's, it's from from uh, organizing events and the sanctioning uh, fees we get from the organizers. We have membership fees from the sailors and we have membership fees from the industry. And that makes up our budget, which is, which is minimal compared to another similar sport, which is surfing. You know, surfing's budgets are, are probably 10, 15, 20 times what, what we have right now. Do you think it would be time uh, to think about going to, to a model run more corporate by, like you say, professionals and media agency. You guys or, or we as a sport got burned one time doing that, but at the same, the years that they have been running it were good. And, you know, just, just because you got, you got a bad experience with one blonde doesn't mean you can't date blondes for the rest of your life, right? Yeah, I won't talk about blondes like that, but um, yes, uh, in a way, in a way, yes, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how, how surfing does, you know, because my understanding of it now is they got a lot of funding for, for two or three years. Um, and they're trying to make it stand on its, on its feet by its own. But my understanding of it is that they're not as a business model that's successful right now, um, as a business means that they're losing money and they're having to invest quite a bit of money into it. Whereas we haven't been that way. We've been actually successful in uh, either breaking even or, or being able to put some money into our reserves year after year. So um, we're, we, we, need, uh, we need to grow. Um, we need to find smart ways of growing. And I'm not, I'm not 100% convinced uh, that we can go back to that other model. If you're, if, if you're not the president, if you're not the democratic president, if you're a dictator, what, what, what do you do? What are your, what are your steps? Invest more in media. So basically, uh, yeah, basically being a dictator doesn't make you richer than being a president. No, it means, it means, reallocating funds so the way the 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 way the pwa is being run right now is the biggest amount of money we're getting is is getting reinvested to its shareholders which are the sailors through prize money you know so and this will this will probably make me the 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 president for the last year but in reality, what, what we need to do is take whatever money we make and put it into media. And one of the things we're looking at for 2021 season is a way to generate a bigger media package, which is going to mean reallocating those funds that we are From receiving. From private money, basically putting a part or all or whatever, some amount of the prize money into media reduce cost as much as we can in terms of how we're running things and we're we've reduced it to the point that what we have left to reduce is the prize money to say this publicly is 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 uh is not normally something i would do but i think what we need to do is reallocate some of that prize money and 
and put it into media. And we need to do that for, for probably a couple of years, create enough value in there that it actually makes it much more interesting for organizers to put on the events, to be able to not only secure the necessary budgets to put on the events, but to secure enough budget to actually make a business out of it. And so I think that's where we're falling short right now is we're not able to provide uh, uh, the possibility to have a very a uh, successful economic model for the organizers. And I think once we're able to do that, secure more events, then we can start securing more funding back to the sailors, you know, but right now we're stuck. We, and we've been stuck in the last 15 years. We've averaged something like 11 events per season. You know, I think the lows have been nine events per year. The highs is something like 13 events per year, but we, we need to, um, we need to get more, events number one especially for freestyle more for ways we need to go down you know we we need to be able to have the money to go have down the line more down the line wave sailing events we need to go to cape verde we need to go to some of the south american breaks some of the pacific breaks you know there, there's a lot of stuff we can do in the sport we know what to do we know how to do it we just don't have the money to do it and i think that's that's an incredibly frustrating part of our job and you know, we, we, we read all the time the criticism on Facebook, you know, guys saying, are you stupid? How come you're not going to this venue or that venue? How come this onshore European stuff and blah, blah, blah. But, uh, you know, the reality what we're facing is the lack of funding. So it's quite funny to read all these things that are just, you know, a fourth grader could figure out. But without, without the money to do that, uh, it's quite difficult. We just, we, we just can't pull it off. And, and um, this is our big challenge. So we need to, we need to, in reality, restructure how we're operating as an association, which is a challenge because I am not a dictator, you know, because we, we are dealing with an association that is somewhat democratically run. Um, so in order to implement some of these changes, I have to convince not only the management board, but also the sailors. You know, but we, we got to decide as an association also, are we satisfied with the tour we have or do we need to make changes? So we're making small incremental changes, but I see over the last 15 years, it's not, you know, if, if we gauge by the number of events we have, the lack of tour sponsorship, we need to fundamentally change our working model. And I think looking at the situation with the world right now, it's not going to get easier. And maybe, maybe it's a good time to actually hit the reset button and be a little bit radical in terms of how we need to approach the tour. And I think, uh, you know, in the past, I've had, I've had ex-sailors come to me and say, Jimmy, zero prize money, get the events on tour, let the sailors give them an opportunity to actually get outside sponsorship. Because if you only have three or four events per discipline per year, that's not legitimate enough to go out and approach sponsors. So that's well, been the problem with that is that the the and this is the back obviously the, the push the pushback you're going to get from the sailors is that that transition is going to take a while. While you know the guys on the top. This is on, on this top, is the big problem. And, and even is... for me, and even for me, for 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 quite a few years, prize money been a significant income. You know. So the budgets are so tight that you're, you're, you know, you're counting kind of every thousand euros you can get, you know? So, um, yeah. Yes. And this is, this is the big challenge. We realize there's going to be a lag between, it's almost like uh, the current sailors are going to make a sacrifice for the future yeah. sailors, so to speak. Um, what I won't, propose to take all the prize money away but i think the smart thing to do now is we're currently uh in discussions to upgrade our media package let's call it uh to do different things with the media package that we believe will be able to uh create better exposure for all of us what are you and targeting are you targeting tv or are you targeting more online or are you targeting i i, I don't want you to give out everything but what, what do you think is the... What we need to have uh, per event, 
we need to have good social media. So good, good coverage on our Instagram, our Facebook pages. We need to have our basic live ticker. We need to have our live stream. We need to have end of day reports. We need to have an end of day summary for YouTube, for example. We need to have a news distribution system that goes out to mainstream media news channels for evening television broadcast news. And we need to generate a show about the event, you know, so a professionally produced show about the event. This is something that can then be distributed to both television and online media, however, whatever you want to call it. You know what I mean? So yeah, like online, something. either television or online television, let's say. Or both, you know. I, I call it a TV show, but uh, it, it's, 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 it's not technically uh, solely for, t for television. You know, imagine something like that goes on Netflix, like uh, you've managed to do with your broadcast, yeah? Um, <laughs> Just to fill in everybody that uh, there was April's Fools, obviously, and I have my little YouTube show or channel or whatever and i put that it's gonna go on netflix and pretty much 80 percent of the people bit on that they were like i got so many con I i've never not the best like result brought me this many congratulations on, yeah you know like text and people i didn't even know like yeah so, yeah no i mean so i think i think we're we're uh, we need to create we need to create that content we need to you know, there's, there's numerous services uh, when you're producing, the, when, when you go to an event, and we need all of them. Jimmy Diaz, a man with a plan. We've been talking for hours now. Let's wrap it up with, uh, with just a couple quick hitters, a section we ask everybody. Uh, what are your pet beefs, and why is it Donald Trump? Oh, man. <laughs> Pet peeves is uh, definitely dishonesty. So I think that covers that covers that uh, that whole thing right there. I'm 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 having I'm struggling, you know, not to get political about the whole situation, but I'm I'm struggling tremendously with uh, obviously I'm I'm American, but I'm struggling tremendously with the political situation in the U.S. and and I find it incredibly disheartening that uh we're in the position that we are and and having such a fight with understanding from our own government what's true what's not true and and uh, i'm just completely disgusted by it you know and i hope i hope things change very quickly here in the very near future but that's definitely one of my pet peeves how many times a day do you pee your wetsuit on average Oof. I'm old school. I don't. <laughs> you know, there's only two types of windsurfers, right? One that, that one that pee their wetsuits and the, one, the other ones that don't admit it. Your top five windsurfers all, all time. Top five windsurfers all time. I'll go with Bjorn Antoine. I like Ricardo a lot you know, for, for sailing. I think Josh, Josh Angulo for natural, raw natural talent. I think that the two, in terms of raw talent, the two sailors I see that, that are the most talented or that I've seen in the sport is Josh and, and Ricardo. Antoine, B Antoine and Bjorn and who else? Yeah, one more. I think, I think Sarakita. What, what she's done is, is, is incredible. You know, I'm, I'm very, very impressed with her. That's a great top five. Most underrated windsurfer of all time. Mo most what? Underrated windsurfer of all time. Whew. You know, there's, there's a guy that used to sail way back, um, an Australian guy called Tom Ludicky. And this guy was an incredible talent and he just, he just kind of disappeared, but he was, he was right up there with everybody. And so, I mean, he was one of the, I remember doing some of my first events out in the gorge and in San Francisco, and this guy was just killing it. And somehow he, he disappeared. So in the old days, uh, 
I think somebody like that nowadays, probably Maciek Rukowski. There you go. <laughs> you think that question is made for me? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, whatever. If you had to sail one spot every day for the rest of your life, what would it be? Shit. I don't think I can answer that. You know, there's, there's, there's so many, there's so many places. Uh, I love sailing, for example, at, at, at Hokipa. But, but I love sailing in, in Alachate here, you know, and those are complete, complete opposites. You know, there's no place flatter than Alachate, for example. And, you know, I, I love wave sailing over there and, and, and then there's there's other places in the Virgin Islands. Sometimes sailing between Saint Croix and Buck Island, it's just unbelievably beautiful, and just kind of brings me back to my childhood sailing days and things like that. So I, I couldn't nail it down to one place. Uh, worst Texas baggage bill or check-in story, for that matter. Go ahead. Check-in story would be too long to tell but it basically involved being stuck in Athens airport for a couple of hours with no money, no possibility of getting the equipment on the flights, which was, if I remember correctly, something like 64 pieces or 30 some pieces that were split between myself, Micah, Sam Ireland, Robert Teritao might have been there or something, but somehow I got stuck carrying everybody's equipment. Everybody left the airport. The airline refused to check it in, and I couldn't get out of there because nobody would take that many bags in one flight. So I got stuck there for several days, a couple days, I think, before somebody took mercy on me. But the highest bill I ever got was for something like 32,000 Deutschmarks at the time which probably close to $20,000, something like that, which we didn't pay. We ended up going, buying another ticket from another airline that charged us five or $6,000, something like that. Also for a ridiculous amount of equipment. What's the furthest you have ever traveled specifically to see a girl? Exactly halfway around the world from Hawaii to Turkey. Most coffees you had in a day? Probably about 10. Who was or is your worst competitor? The guy to always just give you problems. I got to say, one of the guys I hated being in a heat with is Josh Angulo. I just, I just hated that. I would be like the pin end is favored. There's Josh at the pin end. You know what? I'm not going to the pin end today. You know, I, he, he was, he was one guy I could never figure out how to feel confident on the race course with, you know, just a very dominating presence on the start line. Let's say it, on the start line and on the race course, you know, so it was, uh, he was always one that would distract me. Let's say, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of race. Most of the time when I go to the start line, I can, I see, I know who's there, but I don't focus on them individually. It's like, Oh, that's Antoine or, you know, that's wherever it is. But with Josh, I'm like, shit, that's Josh, you know, and that would be a distraction for me. One movie everyone should watch. Movie. Yeah. Shawshank Redemption. That's a good movie. And it finishes in St. Croix. I didn't know that, actually. Last thing. That's St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands. Virgin Islands, nice. And last but not least, who do you want to hear on the podcast? Who do I want to hear on the podcast? Ooh. Say what you mean, windsurfer? Whoever from the windsurfing world, pretty much. I got, I got my wife here shouting out names. <laughs> huh? So who, who, would, who would be an interesting talk? Hmm. We should get Rich out here. We should get Rich Page on the podcast. He's going to hate for saying that. He's never going to agree. 
Maybe we can get John <laughs> Carter. Maybe we can get John Carter. Working. John Carter would be absolutely fantastic to get on the podcast. John is a, John is a great, uh, that would be a great interview. Yeah. You know, a guy that's seen the whole sport through behind his lens, you know. Yeah. That's who you need to get on the, on the podcast. That's a great one. Yeah. We'll work on that. Okay, Jimmy, yeah. thank you for your time. It's been a ton of stories from 30, 30 plus years, 35, yeah. almost 40 years in the sport. Take care, stay safe, and uh, yeah, see you on the water somewhere. Yeah, thank you, Matchek, and uh, keep do doing what you're doing. You know, I think uh, looking at it now from, from this perspective as 33 years or all, all that, and, and I remember uh, I remember you coming on tour, staying, sleeping inside some of the sailor tents and, and going through the real struggle of, of trying to become a professional windsurfer and, and and seeing how you're doing now, you know, and I think you're, you're, yeah, you've actually become quite a good example, you know, for, for a lot of, for a lot of uh, up and coming sailors and kids watching. You're doing a great job with all your media. Your results are coming in and, and you're doing all the right things. So, you know, without sounding condescending, I'm, I'm proud of you. Keep, keep doing what you're doing. Thanks. I appreciate and, that. And we'll see you on the water hopefully soon. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jimmy. And have, have some respect for me if you see me out on the race course too. I do, you know, I always race respect. <laughs> <laughs> right on, Matt Check. Take care. What? You made it to the end? Of course you made it to the end. I told you he was an interesting bloke, El Presidente. He knows his stuff. He knows his stuff. Let us know in the comments uh, what you thought of the podcast, good or bad. We're loving to hear the feedback. Uh, also, who you want to see in future podcasts. That's what we want to know from you guys. We've had a few names crop up. And don't worry, Thomas Traversa has already been on the phone. Yes, uh, he is coming up in future weeks. But for next week, we've got a special guest. Yes, we've got a two times world champion. One once in freestyle, once in wave. Absolute ripping at the moment over in Maui. It is, of course, Marsilio Brown. Uh, and that is a good chat. I can, uh, I can swear to that. Um, also, if you want to click on previous podcasts, I'll stick the links up here. Give us a thumbs up like if you liked it. And don't forget, there's like a beer money link there. I'm me, Matt Check, Alfie. <laughs> it's thirsty work, this, I tell you. It's thirsty work. Thanks for the support, guys. And we'll see you soon.